ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only Dog Waters. And before I start this phenomenal interview with Mike Patterson from Squatch, Ontario, I wanted to share with you some of his evidence, some audio evidence. Now, now I have Mike's permission to share this, and after you hear this, the interview is going to start. But I wanted to make sure that I brought some evidence in because I already know how the community is and some of the things people are going to say based on some of his comments in this interview. So I need you to understand his website is squatchontario.com. You can go there and find more evidence on his posts. But take a listen to this. This is wild as they come. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only Dog Waters, also known as James Williams in the entire paranormal industry, and I'm back. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me say this. If you've been around the past two weeks, you know it's been drama-filled, websites going down, me getting sick, just craziness all across the board. So before I start this interview with Mike and we get into talking about his contact with Sasquatch, 
I want to tell you guys the website is back up and running. Go ahead on over. If you don't see it, clear the cache on your phone. Go back in and listen to the content. We're back up and running. Everything is squared away. Now, with that housekeeping done, I'm excited to spend some time talking to Mike here because a lot of times when we when I talk to people, they're talking about the philosophical side of, you know, their encounters with like Sasquatch and Dogman. They're not real field researchers. Mike is a guy who's been in the field for 14 years and he has a plethora of experiences. So I'm very interested in holding this conversation and finding more about you know these experiences out in the field contact with sasquatch and bigfoot mike how are you today my brother how's everything going for you i'm um, good james thanks man i'm uh, happy to be here thanks for having me on awesome awesome so let's start here you in the pre-interview which was a quick pre-interview guys in all fairness this is really fast pre-interview so we're going to be dancing you're going to listen to both of us dance and fill each other out i was talking about you were talking about the 14 years of experience walk us through how you got started and what was your initial uh, fascination with the topic of Sasquatch? How did you get to the point to where you were like, okay, I want to research this? What happened? Um, it was back in, uh, I don't know, somewhere around 2007, 2008, I started, uh, I think uh, 2007, I basically took up photography, uh, you know, taught myself, bought some good gear, uh, taught myself, uh, you know, all the functions of the camera you know bought a good dslr and some good lenses and just started going into the woods uh searching for wildlife you know looking for some nice nature shots and you know always looking for that national geographic quality shot right and um i love i love the woods love nature so i'd been doing that for quite some time and um and one day i just i, I had an epiphany to start looking for Sasquatch. Don't ask me where it came from. At this point, I honestly think they had something to do with that, um, considering what I've experienced and learned since then. Um, so uh, I, I think they they were watching me. I think they liked what they saw. And uh, I think they had something to do with that epiphany. And so I started looking into the subject and you know, at first, uh, um, like most folks, I think one thinks they have to go out to the West Coast or something to uh, for any chance encounter. And I was uh, surprised to find out that here in Ontario, you uh, know, Ontario, Canada, I'm I'm just uh, roughly a couple hours north of Toronto. Um, I I came to find out that there is uh, Sasquatch here, and it was the last thing I you know would have dreamed of. So uh, that's basically was the start way back then. And, and it was 2008 when it basically started up for me. I'd had things happen in my childhood, but it was, it was a moment uh, incident that happened in 2008 that was basically the, the intro for me getting involved in this work. So you got bit by the Sasquatch bug in 2008, like so many other people. It's amazing, Mike, how um, people are going on about their business, they're living their lives, and they have a goal and objective, especially when it comes to researchers. They're like out, typically they're doing something else and they have an encounter, and it just leads them down this wild, twisting, turning road, uh, and they start to gather and collect information and become these kind of repositories of information about a subject that not many people know anything about. All right, so it's 2008. What happened in 2008 that got you, that where the bug bit you? Was it a sighting? Was it a sound? What was, was it? Um, back then, I, I started looking into it. So, you know, I'm looking at YouTube videos and that. And I'd made a comment on a YouTube video. And somebody ended up contacting me, and they, and they sent me a message. And they asked me, they said, hey, you want to go to a spot where there's been previous activity? And they, they gave me the general location, and I was extremely skeptical, you know, when they told me the area. I thought, what? You know, that's, that's nuts. Um, and it was about a month later, you know, I had a bit of back and forth, and then about a month later, he contacts me again one day, and he goes, you know, well, you want to do this? And I said, okay, let's do it, man, this weekend. And that was Saturday. I showed me where to meet him uh, using we used Google Maps or Google Earth or whatever it was, and uh, met up at this uh, spot. And 
four and a half hours later, you know, he's basically showing me the ropes, doing wood knocks and that sort of thing. And um, so he is about four and a half hours later, about four thirty in the afternoon. I remember it was uh, kind of a drizzly kind of day, right? Sorry, I got <laughs> got a cat here that wants to. Um, and uh, it was a drizzly kind of day, so I. At one point, he had picked up a, about a fist-sized rock. He walked up to a big pine tree, and he smacked the tree several times. And um, he dropped the rock, and it was within a, uh, just a few seconds. I heard this sound like a rapid, really rapid, uh, triple chest thump, like a gorilla chest thump. And, and right away, it, you know, it didn't sit right with me. I know I'm pretty good with my sounds in the woods, so something was off. and. I put my arm up, like basically telling him, be quiet, let's just listen. And just a few seconds uh, later came this triple, really raspy, guttural whoop, um, like triple whoop call that was very close and it filled the forest. It was extremely loud and he sounded 10 feet tall. And I remember back, back then even thinking that, it sounded like he could speak English. It was so pronounced, these whoop calls. And, and you know, even though I didn't see it, you know. When you hear that, you know what it is. It's an instantaneous uh, knowing that that is a Sasquatch. And that is the moment that, that changed my life forever. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. How far away from traditional civilization did this take place? Because earlier you alluded to, you know, it was an area that I couldn't believe it was in. How far away from like houses and paved city roads are we talking about when you had this encounter? Um, it, it, basically, uh, the outskirts of major city. So um, it's a, uh, well, they call it protected area, but they still log it. And I think it was a, uh, couple hundred plus hectares of of force like a, a, a concession a you know what a concession would be um you know if you got a grid a roadway grid and you know a line one line two line third line fourth line basically a mile down the road each one roughly and um so a, a square block concession of a couple hundred plus hectares that there's patches of that throughout the throughout the region so i was in this uh, partic particular one and and the the perimeter of it you know has houses that border the perimeter all around it um, pretty much all around it uh, on uh, one two three sides uh, yeah even four sides um just uh but there's a lot of woods in there but what i've learned um since is they have abilities that have allowed them to stay hidden from us and, and quite easily too. And these abilities have, uh, have kept them safe from humans. And, you know, they're, they're highly underestimated in their intelligence. Um, so the proximity to humans, they can come very close to us and they do. And I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. And one is to teach their children about humans. So they, they do come very close to us. And it would make sense that they need to teach their family members about humans because we can be pretty freaking dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Especially if we're unaware of something and we're not familiar with it, we tend to react violently when we encounter something that we're not familiar with. So it makes perfect sense. You alluded to something, and I would love to go down that rabbit hole if you don't mind because I think I know what you're saying. You alluded to their ability to get close to us. Now, I ran a project uh, for two and a half years called DogmanCams.com. It was a project where we had cameras in the woods. Um, we had some in Taylor, Mississippi. We had some in Winoma, Mississippi. We had uh, cameras in Fort Pierce, Florida, where there was a dogman sighting that was recorded. And I'm going to tell you, Mike, one of the things that I came to learn um from running those live cameras and we're talking about live cameras hundreds of people simultaneously seeing the same thing and then live investigators going out into the field one of the things that i realized is their ability to hide literally right there in front of you is i mean 
it's otherworldly. It really, really is. I'm talking about we caught gigantic heads, like the size of a person's chest. This turned on an angle. Um, you can see a brow. You can see a nose. You can see eye sockets. It's clearly a face. But there was an investigator right there in the field um, 20 yards away. But it was there. And the only reason why we captured that head was because we had a very high-powered LED light that swept in that direction for a split second. And by the time it swept back, that head was gone. What is this ability that they have? Do you think it's something just their natural ability to blend into the environment? Are we talking about cloaking? What has been your experience? What conclusion have you come to as it pertains to that? Um, well, you know, they're definitely um, uh, masters of their environment, so they can blend right in. But um, I've had, I've had uh, many incidents of physical contact over the years. I've been pat on the head and poked and... Um, I, I got to watch how I word that sometimes. That's why I never say, yeah, Sasquatch touched me. <laughs> but I've, I've had physical contact, uh, even sitting in a chair one night outside, and I've had my face covered, uh, my nose and mouth. I think I, I, uh, you know, I assume it was a hand. It was hairy and it was very soft. And I, and I had a visual just before it, it happened, right in front of my eyes, uh, just a few inches from my eyes, this really black, wispy, dark smoke. It was darker than outside. I was able to see this, right? So the physical contact I've had many times um, has shown me that, you know, they're, they're invisible. They can, they can uh, disappear into thin air and they can materialize. I've learned that they're basically masters of earth energies. So I think it's, it's not a device they're using. It's an inherent uh, quality, an understanding of energy. And I think that um, they can manipulate their internal vibration to whatever level of physicality or, or not, like uh, might be cloaking where you can see an outline or completely invisible. Um, and also they have an understanding of uh, that matter you know when you break down to a quantum level is basically empty space so they know how to move that so there are no walls with them i have learned this through uh, constant um, interactions indoors and and uh, even in my vehicle uh, things have happened so yeah it's it's an understanding of energy at a level that is far that you know far surpassed um, that that we understand at least that uh, uh you know that we're told by science at this point who knows what they got going on behind closed doors you know with cern and that sort of thing so no that's wild so hold, we're gonna back up we're gonna go back up so were you doing some kind of experiment because you just said as i'm sitting i'm sitting in a chair and i've had if I'm not mistaken you said you had something over your head you got to walk us. You can't just leave that right there. What happened? How were you doing an experiment? What was going on? Because that sounds terrifying, bro. No, I um, I was sitting in a, you mean when I was sitting in the chair and I, I had uh, this wispy smoke in front of my face before my yes. face got covered? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. Okay, the interactions at that point had developed to a level, you know, that I was comfortable having them around and and showing their presence in, in different ways that they do. They, I was comfortable to the point that, you know, I didn't have any fear anymore of, of them, uh, you know, that I might be harmed or something. That I had that at the beginning, but it, it took a while for that to go away. But after many months, you know, I was cool with that. I was cool with their presence and the physical contact and, and, you know, over time, I, I have developed uh, interaction. There's dozens of drawings given, and it's all, all kinds of crazy stuff. It's all basically paranormal activity. Okay, I got you. So what you're saying is it's, it's you've experienced all kind of paranormal activity with them, and you had gotten to the point to where you were comfortable enough with them manifesting, doing whatever it was that they were doing in your presence because you knew they weren't a threat to you. How do you... I guess if you're being gifted things, um, you get to the point to where you have have an understanding. But sh there was no place or no time where you felt like um, 
you know, for example, having experiences in your car, having experiences in your house, there was no time where you felt like uh, it was a violation of personal space or they had gone too far. Because for me, it would be that would be a rough situation for me to find myself in. Yeah, um, I've learned I have no privacy, basically. That I'm okay with it. You know, I'm cool with it. There's no judgment on their part. Uh, they keep showing their presence, you know, whenever they show up. It's periodic. The activity has followed me. I've, I've moved four times throughout the past uh, 14 years. And wherever I go, it shows a connected consciousness that, they, that they're able to find us. And so that their, their presence can be. You can be in the middle of a big city. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you are. I've had activity having in it, having a discussion with somebody, and and um, she was telling me about an experience she had. And at, at that time, I, you know, things were a bit quiet, and I was like, "Damn, it seems like everybody else is getting activity, but me." And then suddenly, this thing I have hanging from my rearview mirror was wrapped around. Um, it, it's just uh, it, it's something they've done uh, several. So yeah, as far as uh, feeling uh, invaded or you know that I have, I, I'm I'm comfortable with it. I'm okay with it. And so the the lands that you've went on, or the research locations that you went on to, for your first interactions, um, were any of these places um, like Native American? Uh, burial grounds, Native American lands, any, because what it sounds to me like, Mike, is um, it sounds like spiritual manifestations more so than physical manifestations of Sasquatch. I mean, if we're talking about in the city, in those type of locations, it's just, it's not a common thing when we start talking about Bigfoot. So I would be interested in knowing where some of your initial reactions, I mean, interactions took place, um, the land, the history of the land where you first started having these interactions with these creatures, because it just, it just doesn't sound like it's purely Sasquatch. It sounds like it's way more than just Sasquatch activity. And I'm not putting Sasquatch activity in a, in a bucket or a container saying it can only be one way, but I'm just saying I would really be interested in knowing like some of these locations where you had these encounters, like the history of the land. Can you share some of that? Um, I don't think that really any uh, history of the land has to do anything. Perhaps um, energies of the land, you know, due to um, maybe crystal in the ground, you know, that might enhance energies. Uh, there's a an area, uh, there's a documentary out there called The Land Between. It's a three-part uh, PBS documentary that you could, anybody could find online. And it's called The Land Between, and it, it's basically a transition zone um, from southern Ontario, you know, through central Ontario. And it, it's uh, geographically, it's kind of a, um, I think it's, it's it's very rich with fauna and flora and, and and minerals that sort of thing. So that might have something to do with it. But as far as um, the activity and being um, question, you know, questioning if it's all Sasquatch and that they have given me so much supporting evidence, uh, you know, with footprints and me to basically know that yeah, it's Sasquatch. Uh, I know what Neff. Uh, well, the main character, basically, I'll call him a character because he is, he's been the most uh, predominant throughout this. It's, it's the whole family, but um, the one, he's now, I think he's 27 years old now because I got his age. So when this started, he was 17 years old, and his voice was just phenomenal, um, astounding voice on him. And, and, you know, it's very rare to be be given vocals like he's like he's given right the only other guy to capture like that was ron moorhead with the sierra sounds um way back in the the early 70s and uh, you know there's people who have heard them speak and, and people who've heard them speak english and that sort of thing but nobody's really been able to 
it to capture their vocals, especially at a level of direct verbal communication that they've given to me. All right, so you were talking about the voice of um, the one that you said that you've been communicating with. So you were actually able to capture your interaction with um, with him in recordings? Oh, I've, I've been given so much. Uh, I have quite the library of uh, vocal recordings. And I think at one point there was, I think it was nine consecutive visits where there was direct uh, verbal back and forth between us. Um, and and then you know it was interrupted by some uh, outsiders, which is just absolutely uh, you know th th this has been something that that has uh, plagued this situation. When you get as close as I do, um, you basically you get stalked, harassed, trespassing, slandered. You know you're discredited. They they do anything to try and take you down and make it a hoax, right? Um, but yeah, so I had nine consecutive visits where the there was verbal communication going back and forth with this Sasquatch named Nefetia. And I got his name on audio from him uh, after months of me patting my chest, saying my name and asking for his. And then finally, one, one visit, he spoke it. He said, uh, Mike, uh, the property owner's name's Dwayne. So he said, Mike Dwayne Nefetia. And it was like, hey, there, there's his name. He finally gave us his name. We used to call, we used to call him Mister Funny before we knew his name, just because of his antics. The guy's hilarious. So, um, yeah, it's been quite the astounding amount of vocalizations that I've been able to capture on audio. I record every visit. Wow! And so when we say when we start talking about the people trying to discredit you, what type of tactics are we talking about was used against you at this point in time? Was it people just taking your audio, stealing your audio and turning around and saying it's fraudulent? You know, the whole, let me analyze it and call it a hoax. Um, what, what, what kind of stuff did you experience? Um, well, okay. Uh, I used to have uh, John Bendernagel. Um, he was a wildlife biologist. He's passed on. Uh, he was involved for 40 years, very well respected in the, in the field. Um, spent over four decades uh, pursuing this, you know, he's got books written on, and all that. And, and that, excuse me. And then another guy, uh, Dmitry Bainov, who was the science director of Darwin State Museum in Moscow. And he'd been involved since 1964. And he uh, basically carried on the work of Boris Porshnev, who is the founder of hominology. And hominology is basically the, uh, it was Dmitry, goal to have that recognized as a new discipline of anthropology which would recognize the Sasquatch as people so um, both of those science minds supported me and both of them had people uh, uh, well known in this subject contacting them squawking in their ear telling them do not take me seriously uh, so there was that um, there's there's been a online persistent effort to uh, label me a hoaxer and discredit me and all that as i mentioned when you get close to something that breaks the mold basically that changes our understanding of reality and you're just some layman guy like me some no nobody um and you come out with this stuff and start speaking you really get to uh, um basically attacked your your character is attacked so i've had to deal with that for the past 10 years but the the family of sasquatch that that i've interacted with have been so supportive they have given me a mountain of supporting evidence um it's just been constant like from uh, September 2012, when I were making visits to this uh, cottage location, to March 20th, 2015, I've made 80 visits in that time. And then there was a, a lull because of, uh, you know, interference. And then, uh, and now for several years, the, the property owner and I have made amends and we've been back together and we, you know, we've continued this work. So uh, we've had, uh, 
activity on 100% of the visits since day one. It's, it's always happened. We used to joke about it because it was always there and it's just never stopped. So we've been at this now for 10 years and it's been um, activity every visit 100% of the time and it just continues and develops and, and it's like they always give you something new. You know, there's that, that was our motto, always something new. And there's always something new that they do. Even it might be something subtle. And, and it's almost like they're training you and teaching you. Uh, they're, they are extremely efficient in their manner of teaching and, and how they uh, convey uh, their presence and, you know, the information that comes across with small gestures that they give. It's, it's absolutely fascinating stuff. I'm wondering this, Mike, since you, you've had a lot of interaction. So I'm going to use you as a sounding board just to run some questions by you and um, and just try and figure out some things. So in your interactions and based on your interactions, is there has there been any evidence to support, you know, the UFO theory of like flying saucers being connected to Sasquatch? Have you had any, any actions that interactions that would validate that theory that people have had uh, in the thought process out there that, you know, they are so directly associated with UFOs? Um, considering uh, the Sasquatch consciousness and you know the whole interdimensional factor, I I assume that any other beings like that, they all know each other or know about each other, right? Um, so there are cases that I'm aware of where Sasquatch have been seen coming and going from UFOs. And and to answer your question, so it was July, uh, it was July 2018th. I think it was July 4th. I can't remember. I think it was July 4th, 2018. Um, I was given an, uh, I was given a UFO incident and then I was given another one 15 days later. So they were both, um, prime, uh, uh, the, the conditions were prime for, to allow me to understand what was going on. And the first one was absolutely, uh, just blew my mind. So I was driving north on the 400. Uh, so I had Pearson Airport, Toronto, Air, Toronto Pearson Airport on my left, and I'm driving north on the highway. There's, uh, I don't know, there might be 10 lanes there or something, I don't know. Um, so I had a, a transport in the lane on my left just ahead of me and a, a, a vehicle, I believe there was a vehicle right behind that. And it was an absolutely perfectly cloudless day. There was not a cloud in the sky. And if it was, it was so high up you couldn't see. So it was perfectly clear, 12.30 in the afternoon, so the shadows were almost directly under the vehicles, and I'm driving along with the flow of traffic, and suddenly a shadow passes over top of me going just slightly faster than the traffic, um, which is just perfect how they do it. And instantly, I'm like, my, you know, I'm having one of those WTF moments because I realize there's no sound. It's like, what's going on? And I stuck my head out the window expecting, you know, there should be a plane there. And there was nothing. It was just empty space. And I watched this shadow envelop the truck in front of me. And it was over within just a few seconds. But it was just enough for me to know that that was a cloaked ship. It had to be. There, there, there's nothing else that made sense. And then 15 days later, I was up in Neff's area, his home home base, basically. And again, it was pristine conditions. This was at night, though. And I was by myself. And I'm, I'm sitting on this uh, road, and I can see way off in the distance. You know, I'm surrounded by trees and that. And suddenly I see this, uh, this bright light, like, like a, you know, like a, a, a jumbo jet pointed at me way off in the distance. And I almost immediately, and I'm watching it, and it was coming towards me. And um, it didn't take that long, and it passed over the road, just down the road from me, not far. It seemed to be maybe a couple thousand feet in altitude. And when it passed over, uh, there was, it was, I didn't see a craft because it was just a big, bright light, but it was dead quiet. There was not a sound. So it, it wasn't a drone. A drone would have made a sound. This thing was absolutely silent. So th this was two incidents 15 days apart. Wow. And so the Sasquatch that you that you um, have the better relationship, uh, 
I can't, I don't, I forgot what the name, how you pronounce the name. Did it communicate anything to you about these UFOs in any way, shape, or form? I understand you had the encounters, but was there any correlation where it said, yeah, I knew about those UFOs? Or, um, yeah, that's the question. Did, was there any kind of communication about it or any information revealed about those UFO encounters that you had? No. No, it was just an incident that, that happened. Um, All right. So we had our two UFO encounters. Um, and what I was trying to figure out is if that Sasquatch that you have the relationship, the one that you have the main relationship with, if it if it told you anything about the UFOs, you said no. I'm interested in the family dynamic of these creatures. So um, when I talk to witnesses, um, they'll share where they they have seen female Sasquatch, male Sasquatch, child Sasquatches, like um, younger versions of the younger ones, and how playful the younger ones are and were. You've had a long-term relationship with one. Have you seen a growth in maturity level during that time period where you had that relationship where its personality has changed over time? Am I making sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, Neff, he has, uh, well, his foot's grown four inches. Um, it's probably even more now. Uh, so I've documented uh, two-inch growth and then two, another two inches of growth in his foot over eight years. Um, his voice has definitely changed slightly. Um, so he's, you know, from 17 to 27 years old. Um, his, his antics as a, uh, when he was younger, he was a lot more boisterous. He's, he, he has basically toned it down. Um, but there is a younger member of the family. I'm dealing with the whole family, right? So there's, there is a younger member of the family, who basically is uh, seems to be following in his in his footsteps with his with his boisterous antics and and his uh, sense of humor. There is a lot of humor with their people in their interactions. Um, you know, there's uh, there's uh, uh, children and um, both you know female and male involved in this. Uh, and so I've interacted a little bit with multiple family members but mostly the one and yeah i have noticed a slight change in him over the years as as he is mature when we talk about a sense of humor what kind of things do they find to be humorous you know for example i'll have people contact me about encounters where they'll see a sasquatch looking through a window um they'll have pine cones thrown at the house they'll be sitting out on the back porch and um for example you know tree limb snapping what w could any of that be classified as humorous or playful i'm mean, very interested in knowing in what behavior patterns or what things would be directly attributed to um playful a playful personality of a sasquatch from your experience you know as far as their their um interactions go they're definitely playful in nature um, uh, there's been so much happen as far as their humor. So there, there's been instances where, uh, you know, and thankfully I didn't put my foot all the way in my shoe because there's an egg in there. And if I stepped down, I would have broke it and would have had a mess in my shoe. Or, um, I've had, uh, you know, piles of leaves and sticks and put in my bag that, you know, that's sitting in, indoors and even one time, all my clothes are wet, and it's in the winter. So I knew that they threw a pile of snow in there. I've been hit by a snowball. I've had, uh, you know, I've, you know, we have a couple beers while we're there and stuff. So I've had stuff put in my drinks, uh, you know, twigs and leaves and um, and marbles. <laughs> There's been a lot of marbles out of thin air. I'll tell you that. Um, so that it's just, uh, I've even had smells put right up my nose. Um, like, uh, you know, nasty smells. <laughs> and I think that's the young guy. Uh, it, it's, it's always stuff that it, it might be a little bit irritating, you know, sometimes, but it's always harmless. It's, it's never anything that, that causes any, uh, um, physical harm to us. No, I got you. I got you. I'm on the same page with you. Um, and I, I was really interested in knowing that because I get so many eyewitness encounters, I want to be able to know, okay, hey, 
you know, you found some marbles or you found this, that's them being playful versus them being aggressive. Have you guys found yourself in a situation where um, the tide has changed or there was a bad day for one of these creatures where you experienced some aggressive behavior or some warding off warning type of behavior? And what would that, what was that like if you had anything like that? You know, it's, I, I can't say that's ever happened in, in a decade of this um, stuff going on. It's always been very benevolent. Um, there's never been any uh, cause for concern, you know, that I've experienced, that I've witnessed. It's always been just, uh, yeah, I've never had any reason to, uh, to fear, ever. I got you. I got you. And I just want to, for, I guess you can say for understanding purposes, we're talking about the same location, the same family, and you guys are going out to their location, basically where they are. I know you've had interactions away from this location, but the majority of the interactions have taken place at that one location. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a private property. Um, it's on a lake. There's a lot of cottages around there. It's cottage country, we call it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cottages there. Um, the neighbors are pretty close. It's all surrounded by woods. You know, it's bear country, moose, you know, whatever, all that stuff. It's all there. Um, what I've learned is it doesn't e it doesn't matter the proximity of humans. If, if there is, let's say, uh, all, everybody there, all the neighbors around, um, the activity still goes on. And, th and nobody has a clue except us who are having the encounters and the activity. And at this point, uh, much of it happens indoors. So I'm do like, I'm asking questions to them, uh, you know, through uh, using a chalk pad or a chalkboard and a sketch pad. And, uh, you know, I've been given dozens of drawings and, and certain questions, you know, I don't get all the questions ans answered, but I do get some questions answered. So I've been, you know, getting some uh, pretty phenomenal information from them you know like i i asked uh um how long do your people live in human years they didn't respond to that so i changed my question and i said do your people live longer than 200 human years and they wrote yes they put a y for yes um and then i tried to get more info on that i said do they live longer than 500 years no response i lowered it to 300 no response so i got more than 200 years right could be a thousand but you know that's what they told me um so uh, you know i've developed this uh, written communication over the years and like i said there much of that the activity there's as much going on indoors at this point as out if not more you know at this point so uh, i've learned they've been able to they're able to manipulate absolutely all of our electronics i'm talking everything phones cameras video cameras audio recorders doesn't matter computers they can manipulate all of them um i've had some just crazy stuff happen that well you know when i tell some of the stories people just think i'm batshit crazy right but i wear that i wear that badge of honor proudly <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest with you, bro, when we start talking about Sasquatch and Dogman and things that go bump in the night outside of this entire community, everybody looking at us thinks we're bat crap crazy, bro. So it doesn't really matter. The community itself can be harsh and they can be critical and they can be pretty much jerk offs. And that's one of the problems that we have. But I don't think you're crazy. I'm just interested in getting to the bottom of some of these things and learning more about it. So you got to worry about that with me. What about the people in the surrounding areas the, around that, you know, let's say it's a lake, right? And you guys have, you're on the north side of the lake. Has anybody in that other the vicinity or the area, has anybody else ever come up to you guys and be like, hey, I saw something or I encountered something weird? Or is it that you two guys, because I know it's more than just you, you've referred to someone else being out there with you, the landowner. Um, or is it just being you two guys that have been singled out? Um. I, way back, it was the landowner who had contacted somebody else that I was uh, working with at the time, again, because of a, a comment on a YouTube video. He was looking for somebody to come investigate the property, and he'd actually filed a couple of reports with the, the BFRO, and they never, um, 
they never responded. Um, and uh, thankfully they didn't. And uh, actually at this point, I, I think, you know, they weren't meant to. Um, so I ended up getting this information, you know, fell into my lap and I interviewed him and, and then I got him and his spouse and then I got an invite to their cottage, to their property. And, and I knew from day one, I had about four years experience at that point, And I knew from the very first night that they did indeed have Sasquatch on their property. They had suspected for about five years, um, certain things that had happened. And when I had gone in and asked certain questions, I, certain questions, I realized that, no, you've been having things go on for decades. You just didn't know it. Um, so uh, at this point, we've, uh, we don't discuss this with any neighbors or anybody around there. We keep this to ourselves. We keep it as quiet as we can. We don't want any attention. Um, and we, we prefer the winter because of the snow on the ground. Uh, you know, the Sasquatch family, they, they love to show their prints and, you know, we, we've documented hundreds of them. All of them go nowhere. It's either sometimes a single print or a trackway. And they, they've shown us that I've learned that they choose to leave their prints. And th it also allows us to keep an eye on anybody stalking or trespassing, you know, cause the humans, they can't hide their prints. Right. So uh, winter is our favorite time. And also at that time of year, a lot of the cottagers, uh, um, they've closed their cottages, uh, you know, for the year, right. There's still people that live up there, but, um, for the most part, it's, it's pretty quiet. It's a great time of year for us to go up there and, and, um, we keep it to ourselves. We don't want anybody else basically knowing what's going on. And, and we've done a pretty good job with that over the past decade. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I know, um, you know, the BFRO itself, if I'm not mistaken, when the BFRO they may be back, they may have changed it now, but when they get in accounts and encounters that sound like they're paranormal more than physical, I believe that they, they tend to like shelve them and put them to the side. Um, what do you say to people who say that the stuff that you're talking about sounds more pure supernatural or demonic activity? Because I know people have to ask you this question because it, it sounds like it's more supernatural. Now, granted, I have not. So before anybody be like, yeah, I agree with you, Dog Waters. Granted, I want to say this. This is what it sounds like. I, I haven't had Mike show me any footprints. I even haven't even asked Mike. So before anybody gets to being like trying to leverage my question against this man, I want to be clear with you guys. This is just a question. I have not asked for any proof. And he may pull up 200 pictures of footprints. But the point I'm making is, what do you say when people actually hit you with that question? Because I can see somebody sitting here saying, yo, Mike, your boy Mike is crazy, dog waters. Like, for real, he's got like... He talking to a demon. Um, when you start talking about them writing back and all that, I'm pretty sure you've seen this before. These questions. How do you answer that when that's presented to you? Yeah, you, you know what I've learned, James. Of you know, throughout doing this, I've learned that we've been, we we are so manipulated as a species. We are so conditioned, um, so brainwashed by uh, you know the teachings of this system that what I'm learning through, through my interactions is, um, I don't believe a bloody thing that comes out of a government's mouth anymore. Um, I question everything, uh, put out by science. I question everything put out by NASA. I don't, I don't believe any of it anymore from, from what I'm witnessing. Um, you know, the, the whole connotation of, uh, religion and, um, you know, it's all human construct. You know, there's all this human construct that we adhere to that, you know, we're stuck on. And it's very difficult for, for most people to step outside of that and and look at things from a different perspective. And, you know, the, like my own family think I'm dealing with demons, but it's completely opposite. They're, they're actually very evolved and loving and compassionate. They're, they're, they're further advanced than we are, um, you know, in their consciousness. And they're, they understand that love is the, the, the most powerful force there is. They, they, they already got this figured out. Um, you know, like it's humans that are um, unevolved. So it's, you know, when presented with all this paranormal stuff, a lot of people will, 
jump to the conclusion that it's demonic when in fact what do you really know about it you don't know anything absolutely nothing you know you you're only, you only know what you've been taught or you know told to believe and just because you don't understand it so you jump to some conclusion uh, some negative conclusion when in fact it's uh, you know it very likely might not be anything like that at all um i've had experiences throughout my life that have uh, um, periodically things that have happened throughout my life that have shown me that there's much more going on than you know what we've been led to believe there there is other dimensions going on and there is intelligent life you know that uh, we don't have to look out in space for it it's right here and, and it's watching us and it's interacting with certain humans they choose and i'm not saying there isn't dark stuff out there because there is you know in fact it's uh, basically manipulating our entire existence um, as humans and and um, my understanding is there's an attack on human consciousness there are a bunch of psychos that do not want us to evolve they they don't want our consciousness expanded um, and when you have what I have and you're given that contact um, it really opens up your mind and shows you a, a whole new perspective on on reality and it actually gives you hope you know, it gives you hope that, wow, there, you know, there actually is hope for the future, you know, instead of this, this dark, whatever that's been, you know, pulled over our eyes. Uh, so, um, people just, you know, they need to just step back and, and, and take a different look and, and understand that, you know, it might not be as you think it is. No, that's an interesting response. Um, I would I wouldn't mind um, seeing some of the footprints and things of that nature because it sounds like you have a very close relationship with this clan. I'm gonna call them a clan um, because it, you know it may be just one family, but I'm sure I'm assuming that that one family is connected to another family in that area and that they all communicate amongst each other. What about things like trade and exchange within their species? Have you had any insights into things such as that? Um, well, we, we have been given gifts from them, and we have exchanged gifts. Um, you know, we'll leave stuff for them. They've given these uh, uh, several, like, hand-woven uh, twig uh, sort of, uh, you know, there, there, there's been quite a few of these things. Some of them are very intricately woven, and some of them are, are, you know, more, I don't want to use the term crude, but just you can tell they're done uh, by a, a child, you know, that, that doesn't have the experience where some of them are, you can see that they're very experienced. So, uh, you know, they've given us uh, certain gifts and um, that's happened over the years several times. And um, as far as, you know, what they do among their people, I, I don't have any idea. The, you know, there's communication that goes on, but it's very limited. Uh, you know, there's they're highly telepathic. I've had uh, several experiences of, of telepathy in different ways. You know, mind speak that is very loud. Um, the first time, uh, it was back in 2013. I was crashed on the couch and and uh, at home, and and I got a grunt in my head so loud it it instantly shot me to my feet from from asleep on the couch. I just like, boom, I was on my feet and on the phone to the, the property owner telling them what just happened. And it just absolutely mind blowing. And you know, they've, they've shown me their, their ability to do that. It's absolutely astounding. Um, and there's different ways that they, uh, it's like they, they have an understanding of our subconscious, you know, to the point where they can make contact in our dreams and they are not dreams. They are actual contact from them. Um, reaching out, uh, you know, I've I've had numerous experiences over the years that have just their abilities are absolutely astounding. They they are masters of Earth energies. I gotcha. Well, Mike, we're running up against the time. I think this is a great conversation, man. I really enjoyed it. You gave me so many new insights into Sasquatch um, and just different ways to think about the whole subject. Do you want to share or go ahead and share information about where people can find you, your website, your YouTube, um, anything you have in the pipeline? Do you have any books coming out? What do you have that my audience needs to be taking a look out and taking a listen to? 
How do they find you? Where do they need to go? Okay, so I have a YouTube channel. There's uh, quite a few videos on that. Sasquatch Ontario. Um, in that order, the other way around is not me. That's an organization I have nothing to do with. They're, you know, it's completely opposite what I do. So Sasquatch Ontario on YouTube. Um, and then I have a website, SasquatchOntario.com. And if anybody wants to reach me, though, there's a contact page on that. Or you can reach me at SasquatchOntario at Yahoo.ca for Canada. Um, you know, the, as far as my uh, channel goes on YouTube... There's a lot of audio throughout and, uh, you know, a lot of footprints, this and that. You know, over the years, I put a lot of stuff that I haven't really explained in detail. So I'm actually going to be posting more um, and taking some of that older stuff and, and going into the details of uh, what, you know, how that came about, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of information on there and, it, and it's very advanced, uh, you know, for this subject there. Uh, you know, the, there isn't many people out there who, who can say that they've had ongoing contact in, in hundreds and hundreds of encounters with these uh, these ancient hairy folks. So uh, um, I, I am a wealth of information. They, they have really blessed me with a gift that um, is truly, it's meant to be shared to help others. So that's what I do. Awesome, brother. Awesome. Thank you for spending some time with me. I'm going to make sure that I post a link to your YouTube channel in this uh, YouTube video. I'll be releasing this tomorrow for everybody to listen to, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so when you get it, it is tomorrow. And then, Mike, I'll put, you know, your email address and all your contact information there. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get in contact with Mike and talk to him about your encounter, I know some of the people in the audience, my audience, Mike, have experienced mind speak because um, I had people reach out to me about it. And you might be the perfect person for them to talk to. Um, because it's something that you guys will have in common. So, Mike, I appreciate you spending some time with me, brother. It was a phenomenal interview. And I'll have Wes reach back out to you and have you back on again soon, man. Awesome. Cool, James. I appreciate you having me on. And, uh, yeah, I'll send you a, I'll send you a couple links through email there uh, to uh, throw it up there. Sounds good. All right, brother. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.